um, um, if you had any, if people had specific insect issues, especially in grain crops, I work in grain crops this year because um, unlike in previous years in Pennsylvania, um, we had some particular problems. So I'm going to share my screen. And if I don't know if I'll be able to see the chat, yeah, I'll make but, sure um, I I'll make sure I tell you, Mary, if there's all right. Something. Awesome. So I will start that. So this is actually the end of my presentation today. Um, as Aaron said, I'm an entomologist. Um, I've been at Penn State since 2002, and um, during that entire time, I've focused on uh, pest management in organic systems. And so um, I just wanted to start out um, with some slides on some particular pests that we had issues with this year. So I've been working in these organic systems for about 20 years. And for most of that time, except for just a few minor exceptions, we have not really in our um, field crops, in our corn, especially soybean, um, small grains, we haven't really had any serious insect pest problems. And that always kind of surprised me. But so what I've done, instead of focusing on pests, I've for 20 years focused on biological control, mostly generalist uh, natural enemies and also insect pathogens. But this past year, it was really buggy and it caught me off guard. And especially um, the problems we had um, this year were seed corn maggot, um, fall armyworm and Western bean cutworm. So I definitely, because Aaron mentioned fall armyworm, I did wanna talk about what happened with fall armyworm this year. And, um, and hopefully it won't be a continuing trend. I, so, Fall armyworm, um, it is native to Central America, um, South America, and the Southern United States. It's a tropical species, and um, they require, they're usually um, endemic in warmer areas where they have several generations per year. They overwinter and they breed in Texas and Florida in the US. And then in uh, the spring, so the populations build up down in Texas and Florida and the southern southeastern United States. Um, they get blown up here with um, storms and wind. And when that happens, it really coincides with as corn is being planted as you um, move north from uh, south upwards. And so, um, that it's considered a late season pest because by the time it gets up here, it is later in the season, as opposed to down in the South, it's pretty much a year round pest. Um, so the moths get blown up on these weather fronts and then they lay eggs and the eggs hatch about a week later. And you probably don't even notice it in corn because the small larvae um, don't do a lot of damage. Um, and it's not until those larvae develop into larger in, uh, stages when they really eat a lot that you start to notice uh, the damage from, from them. And by then, even in conventional systems, it can be too late really to do anything. Um, because it is this tropical pest, some of the moths then in the fall return south, but mostly they um, those larvae that are still around and pupae and even the moths, they can't take the low temperatures below about 40 degrees or so, definitely not freezing, and they're killed by frost. And so because of that, just because you have a problem in one year for this particular insect does not doom you to having a problem in um, subsequent years, which is that so, so that's good. So what happened in 2021, uh, there was a warm winter across the south, and and so those larvae in the uh, pupating uh, moths or insect, they were not killed at a high rate down there. So a lot of moths survived, 
And then, um, so there were really good conditions to build up large populations of Paul Army worm in the south. And then there were a lot of tropical storms last year. There were 20 named storms. And um, in addition, because of these tropical storms, even where um, people did have, conventional growers did have spray programs in the south, because there was a lot of rain that could lead to potential spray um, failures, and because there was rain, there was a good, healthy, lush crop as they were being crops as they were being blown north for them to survive. So, um, so that is why last year, I don't know if in your region, but in our region, uh, fall armyworm was a big problem. And so, if weather patterns are changing and this continues, we can expect to have um, fall armyworm in future years. But if this was just sort of a cyclical weather pattern um, and not really climate change related, then um, it will just depend on the particular conditions in the in the south. So that's what happened with fall armyworm. So again, those moths arrive from the south in the mid to late summer, the eggs, the moths mate and lay eggs. And then there are these seven larval stages. They start out very, very small. They go through their um, development. And um, you may have seen them. They're recognizable by this sort of Y-shaped marking on their head. And in the north, probably in your region, in our region, and farther north, um, they may not even finish a whole uh, generation by the time they get here, but they can still do plenty of damage that is these lar large larvae but there may not be enough growing degree days left for them to um, finish their development and lay more eggs, which would be killed anyway um, by uh, frost. But usually you see that damage um, late in the summer, early fall, and it looks, you know, like very ragged. The uh, moths really like to lay eggs in the whorl. Um, when they first attack, and so when those the whorl unfurls, you get these uh, looks like rows of holes, and then as the larvae feed, they even get more ragged, and the frass looks a little bit like um, sawdust. Um, not what, and those large larvae start making a big mess. It's it's kind of moisture and wetter, and then they can also get into the ear. Um, <clears throat> so when they get into the ear. These larger larvae are cannibalistic, so you usually only find one larva uh, per ear, um, as opposed to some other pests that we have. But a lot, a lot of these cutworms and armyworms, they are cannibalistic, and so that's why you only get um, one uh, one of the one worm per ear in corn. And as they um, destroy a crop, they will they have a huge host range. Um, like 350 plant species. So it's really hard to choose crops that they are not, uh, that wouldn't necessarily suffer damage from those, uh, all of the field crops. And they especially like grasses and grassy weeds. So because of um, when you start seeing the damage, they're really um, difficult to control, even in conventional systems. There are pheromone traps that are available that you can monitor for flights of the moths to sort of, um, there's not really a lot you can do about it except know that they're gonna be a problem. There are pest reports that you can watch that you can sign up for. Um, those eggs are on the foliage um, and there are allowable materials or registered materials for organic systems, whether it's economic or not to treat a field crop? I can't really say. I suspect no. Um, but on higher value crops, sweet corn or um, vegetables, it, it, it probably is if you have a heavy infestation is. The thing is, is you have to treat the larvae when they're tiny, um, when they're just um, really in those really er early instars. So you have to be monitoring for egg masses or using pheromone traps to see when those flights are. Because once they're in the um, ear or once they're larger, these um, materials um, are not effective. <clears throat>
They do have a lot of natural enemies and diseases that cause a lot of mortality. So it just depends on, you know, there are probably always some fall armyworm around, not at the level that we had, but usually they're kept under um, a, a levels that aren't economically damaging by natural enemies and diseases. They have parasitoid wasps. There are a lot of uh, predatory insects that get them. They get a viral disease that um, can knock them out. And again, the frost will uh, kill them. This was a, um, is an example. So weed control is pretty important, especially grassy weeds. This is from a study um, where they compared the development of fall armyworm on different uh, um, weeds um, compared to on corn. And these uh, grassy weeds, uh, Johnson grass and goose grass, um, which is related to crab grass, um, the development was not different from on, and survival was not different than on corn. Um, so they're very happy on some of these grassy uh, weeds. There was a little bit less um, uh, survival on pigweed and Bengal dayflower. You guys might not have it up there. That's a more tropical or subtropical weed. And um, fleabane is related to um, mare's tail and uh, the survival was very poor on, on that. So weed management um, can be a pretty important control uh, measure for fall armyworm too. Okay, so again, they have a lot of natural enemies. All these generalist natural enemies will um, eat the eggs and small larvae. The later stage larvae and um, uh, what are called the pre-pupae before the our armyworm pupates and goes to the soil. Um, birds and raccoons, skunks will eat those, especially out of the soil, but those can also, actually those mammals can be damaging in a crop. They uh, dig them up in the soil. And then again, they get uh, a lot of diseases from viruses, fungi, protozoa, bacteria, insect parasitic nematodes. Okay, so I'm gonna skip back now um, except I do want to just talk about if you don't want to monitor these things with pheromones yourself, there are um, web reports where, that you can follow that will um, report on the numbers of these insect pests that um, come in, especially these mi more migratory ones like fall armyworm. Um, and uh, th this is a site for Wisconsin. And then um, there's a site called Insect Forecast. It is industry-based, um, but it has really great information on following particular um, insect pests that, and you can predict when these pests are gonna show up in your area. And this particular site, Insect Forecast, uh, follows black cutworm, corn earworm, corn rootworm, soybean aphid, and Western bean cutworm. And so it has an insect tracker and it has maps and I'll show you an example of the map and it sends alerts and migration maps. And if you don't wanna do all that, you can um, do it more. It's a more difficult way. If, if you know when they show up, there are also information on how many growing degree days are necessary for the development of these insect pests. So you can predict when they're gonna be damaging and um, there's a growing degree day ca uh, calculator um, from out of Cornell, that's actually very useful. You can uh, plug in your location and um, the date, and you can. It will tell you how many growing degree days have um, uh, elapsed or accumulated in your area. Okay, so this is from that insect forecast website, and um, it's actually pretty slick. You, it will give you a, a risk report based on um, your location and the particular uh, insect that you're wanting to track. And currently, um, it's these uh, five insects. And this one is for Western uh, bean cutworm, which uh, is endemic in most areas now. It was originally before 2000 in the Great Plains, and then it has uh, spread throughout 
this northern tier in um, mid-Atlantic. Um, so this is uh, an insect that you can track at this site. And what happens is for a particular date, you can plug in a date and it will tell you your risk level. It, it shows sort of a map of where you're, there are outbreak conditions and they have a color coded um, map system. So here, uh, the, this yellow was more intense uh, infestation than in this area with the green. So that it's actually, it's kind of fun to play around with this site if you like to be on the computer and play with these sort of things. To look at what happened, you could see what happened last year at this point, you know, nothing's happening right now. Okay, so now I'm gonna escape and go back to of my general. So there are some questions, Mary. Oh, okay, about sure. So, and this is one that I remember getting some emails or seeing on the listserv um, wire worms. And so, I don't know if oh. you can talk more. I think I may have asked you about wire worms because you're my go to. Person. Yeah, yeah. So what wire about worms. Rotation impacts wire worms, or is there other, are there management? Um, wh when do they show up? Are there, there management strategies? So wireworms are difficult because there are different species of wireworm and they have different lengths of development time. So some can be wireworms, you know, they're click beetles. Some can be worms in the soil feeding on your corn roots or whatever for one year, some three, some seven. So um, I think you need to work with extension and kind of figure out what species you have you can bait early in the season to see if you have a wireworm problem. And apparently one worm, one wireworm per bait um, is considered economic. Um, so the way you do that is you soak corn or uh, small grain until it's sort of soaked up water. And then you put that in some like a container or you can just bury it and you dig a hole in your field where you're gonna plant um, before planting and um, you bury that and then you come back um, that ferments a little bit in the soil and germinates and it's very attractive to the um, wire worms in the soil and um, you can come back and dig that up before you plant again so you might do it like three or four weeks before you're planning to plant um, and then you can leave it down there a week or two weeks and then dig it up. And if it has wire worms in it, you know you have a problem. Usually wire worms are a problem in heavier soils or where you have turned in sod. If you've had like an elf, maybe a, a mixed grass alfalfa field, I don't know how much, how common that is where you are, or a sod, a hay field, a pasture in your rotation. A lot of organic growers here um, have, um, uh, mixed hay uh, in their rotation to build up soil organic matter and um, nitrogen for a following corn crop. That situation is actually pretty attractive to a lot of insects, unfortunately. And so you really need to let that stuff decompose well before you uh, plant. But at that in rotation, and rotation again is tricky because some of those wireworms have a wide host range and some of them have very long periods of time that they live in the soil. So a long rotation, um, which is hard, I know, especially if you're growing corn for feed in your own situation or if you're growing corn for sales. So I probably didn't do a good job of it. <laughs> Not a hopeful job in organic systems, but. The thing is, is they usually are sporadic in space and time, and you may be able to, if you have fields that are, are particularly troublesome, you might have to go out of a particular crop for a while. So Chris like Wilson put in the chat, he's not too far from Madison, a dairy farm, that they have wireworm problems following alfalfa grass mix. Alfalfa, that it's yeah. manure elf applied. Right, it's manure. manure. It, it makes yeah, sense. lots of organic matter. Those uh, high organic matter, it's great for soil health, but there are some particular insects that that also favors. And so, right, so, so wireworms are one of those, and that's the case where you, 
you say, well, if I do have this particular problem, again, I'm going to have to rotate out of that. And if you're on a dairy farm, I mean, there's, there's not a good solution for that. He, he's asking too, does fall or spring tillage impact the wire worms at all? That I don't know. I could look that up and um, send that to you. Certainly like if you, I, it will be worse for a, several insects that are attracted to decomposing organic matter if you're doing that in the spring. The issue is, is if you do it in the fall, then you have that exposed soil all winter, which is also not great. But if you have a particular insect problem and you're gonna manage for that insect problem, then I would guess that the fall tillage, early fall tillage um, would be more disruptive to there and the earlier the tillage, right? So um, we find fewer problems with um, insects. Uh, so that if you have a small grain in the rotation, that's really useful because it makes your tillage um, at a very different time than in the fall. So if you can rotate with small grain, sometimes that's helpful too. Uh, then you have a sort of a mid season uh, July, August tillage, and you might follow that with a cover crop that you then turn in in the spring and let that decompose well. Um, he but, and Kyle both said that they've both gone to higher seeding rates for corn to offset yeah. the loss in population. Yeah. And, and Kyle mentioned too that um, that their agronomist thinks the wireworms are following a hog manure application. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't really have hog manure here. So that's interesting. We're using uh, either a uh, dry poultry manure and poultry litter or dairy manure or a little bit of bedded pack, but mostly liquid dairy manure in this area. And um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, spring armyworms and, and how cover crop management, especially a green manure cover crop might impact Armyworm populations? Yeah, true armyworm. Yeah, tr yeah. Yeah, that's one that unfortunately they lay their eggs on green stuff early in the season. So that's before your crop. And then um, <clears throat> when you manage those cover crops, if there is germinating corn around, that's when they're going to show up. They're going to move onto the corn. So again, um, what we've been doing. You know, we've roll, been working a lot with rolled cover crops. And then as those dry down and are dead, um, then we're planting into rolled. I know you're doing something a little bit different up, up there going into living cover crops. But we find that um, planting into that rolled mat, it really, the natural enemy populations is the ground beetles really build up in that um, mat of rolled cover crops. So even when we've had um, true armyworm around, we haven't had a tremendous amount of damage when we no-till plant into that rolled mat of cover crops. But they're another one, yeah, they'll move on from uh, green. And another thing about the, those pests, they're really difficult. We monitor with um, pheromone traps just because they're highly mobile. So unfortunately you could be doing, you could be doing really great practices to suppress them, but with these highly mobile pests like fall armyworm, Western bean cutworm, um, true armyworm, they are gonna fly in from anywhere, right? So somebody next to you might not be doing a good job of managing, but. So I know if with, yeah. if with spring or um, seed corn maggot, we, we've we recommended, although there is a model available. There's a model, yeah. Um, but you know, more generally, we recommend to wait about two and a half weeks yeah. to pass cover crop termination. Kyle and also, another, oh, go ahead, Mary. Well, another thing you wanna do is um, you really wanna wait to plant, and I know this is really hard. I mean, you have to plant when you have to plant, right? But if you can wait until the soil is really warmed up enough to get that, especially corn, to like really germinate quickly, 
Like if you have good planting conditions, good soil moisture, um, warm conditions, what you want to do is a, a lot of that damage, it's, it's really when the plants are germinating and when they're seedlings that they're really vulnerable. So you want to get that seed to germinate and up out of the ground um, and, you know, more than a few inches high as quickly as possible. Um, so the weighting on the corn, I mean, the seed corn maggot, yeah, that seed corn maggot, there is a model um, that you uh, calculate de growing degree days so that you hit the period when the uh, maggots become pupae and so they're not feeding. And so you want your corn to really get up and out of the ground fast during that time when they're pupae in the soil. And then the flies come up and usually the later generations of seed corn maggot aren't a problem but they are attracted to the decomposing organic matter if you're using tillage. And um, we use that model to plan our plantings at the research. Yeah, position. yeah, because we have gotten caught by that too. But yeah, that's always tricky. It just depends if you, you're you expecting a problem because so often, you know, if especially here, we've had some really wet springs and, um, it's like, well, when the soil's ready, we just have to go, whether, you know, the timing is perfect for seed corn maggot or not. Luckily, we haven't um, usually suffered much loss from that. But the um, higher seeding rates is also, for most of these um, early spring pests, uh, um, is a good idea. Are there any tricks about cover crop management and cutworms? Kyle mentioned that several years ago, he had mm. bad cutworm in half the field and the half that was bad with cutworms had an overwintered rye cover crop that was worked in and the other half with no cover crop was fine. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, they can be where there's a lot of res surface residue and that's something you can time too. We also do pheromone trapping for black cutworm. Um, and uh, you can hit that just, it's similar to true armyworm. You know, the moths are around, they lay in their eggs in the, um, in the cover crops and on weeds. And so <clears throat> if you, it's, I mean, pheromone trapping, you have to learn how, well, you use the specific pheromone with the pheromone traps. And then you can see when the flights are happening. And um, if you have heavy flights, you'll know that there are egg laying, those egg laying adults that are can move off of your cover crops. But yeah, um, I know some growers around here have had that problem where they've done rolled cover crops and they've planted at a time when their seeds are, their plants are just germinating and it hit that flight at just the wrong time. So a lot of this is like based on monitoring, really expect knowing what has to expect. And a lot of times these things are reported. Like I said, you can follow particular websites and they will report um, if you have a, a monitoring system in the state. We have one here um, where uh, ed educators report um, flights of these insects so that people can try to avoid uh, their plants being at a susceptible stage when those uh, flights are happening. So there's there's a couple of storage questions. I don't know if, if you're comfortable answering storage questions about flower beetles um, um, in storage. Is there a effective cold storage temperature to kill the beetles um, or and, yeah. uh, and weevils? Yeah, I don't have a lot of information. I do have an extension bulletin on that. <laughs> I wrote it a few years ago. I mean, a lot of it is sanitation. And um, if you are, have a large facility, sort of the um, mixing, and, but definitely um, sanitation is super important and cleaning like under the floors and everything to get rid of those and to have really tight, a tight um, system. Some insects, it depends if they feed in the grain, if the eggs are laid like on the grain and the larvae are always in the grain. I can't remember which ones. Um, but those ones are hard to kill with DE. Some uh, insects like the um, Indian meal moth, you can have DE, uh, diatomaceous earth on the surface, on the top of your um, grain uh, in storage, and that will help. 
And it's some of those insects also are just in the top uh, few inches or several inches, and that can be um, move, removed. So I put I the can... link to your bulletin in the chat. We uh, yeah. had it on our okay. website. <laughs> so OK, good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's not my area, but we had some questions about that. So I pulled that together a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, okay. if anyone needs a PDF copy, just email me and let me know. I'm happy to to send a PDF copy to folks. Um, okay. I think that's all the questions for okay. now, Mary. So you can go on. With all those. right. So yeah. So I just wanted to talk then about a general approach. You know, kind of good practices for insect pest management. And there are all always. I, I shouldn't say always because we didn't have any for like 20 years till last year. Um, and I don't know why that is, if it's just our geographic area or we use good rotations, we have a lot of diversity in our rotations. Um, but so I like to approach pest management as like as part of soil health. And so, you know, you guys have probably all been to lots of soil health webinars and sessions and know a lot about that, that uh, soil health um, is an integration of the physical, chemical, and biological. And I like to really focus on the biological. Um, the idea is if you can get a, a healthy um, crop, it's competitive with weeds, and it's also less attractive to insect pests. And if you do have pests of most kind, which are usually in the environment, but they're not causing an economic level of damage, is those um, healthy plants are more tolerant to insect damage and disease. And so really the, um, the focus is on like, how do, how do I know if I have healthy soil and um, how do I manage for that? And you probably have expert growers at that, I know. So I'm sorry if I'm being really redundant, but you know, um, there's a lot of ways and tests for um, soil health, but really I think one of the most important things to measure is soil organic matter if you have soil tests done, um, because good soil organic matter, you have good nutrient retention, good soil fertility, usually the structure um, is pretty good in the aggregate stability or the soil stability is good. You can look for particular organisms, earthworms. You can measure on your own decomposition rate. You know how fast your residues are decomposed. If you if they sort of disappear pretty quickly, it means your um, soil is probably pretty biologically active. You know, there's this funny soil, your undies. <laughs> you can bury some cotton underwear and see how fast they disappear. Um, and all those things are indicators. You can buy tests, but soil respiration, I. You know, it's, I think it's just the easiest is to really follow your uh, soil organic matter and looking at how quickly your residues are um, uh, decomposed. And um, certain organisms are sort of indicators like earthworms, but not everybody has earthworms and I don't like people to freak out if they don't. You can spend a lot of money sending your soil off to, and it's interesting if you like to follow that sort of thing. Okay, so you know there's a ton of, more than tons, eight cows worth per acre of organisms in your soil, like contributing hopefully to your soil health. Most of them are beneficial or neutral for us. Or the, uh, a minority of them are pest organisms. Of course, those are the ones we like to focus on when we have a problem. Uh, most of those organisms are microorganisms. We can't really see them. Uh, things like bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa. And then we have the small animals. Again, those are usually, you might be able to see them with your naked eye if you have good eyesight and you have high populations. Or if you dig through a compost pile, you will see these things um, because they're more numerous, the microfauna or the microscopic sized animals things like nematodes, springtails, springtails, and mites. And then you have the larger organisms that you can see, the macro fauna or the large animals, things like the earthworms and beetle larvae, spiders, those sort of organisms. So um, the microorganisms 
um, in soil can be really important for pest management because a lot of them infect, compete with, or antagonize pest organisms, both plant disease causing organisms and insects. They contribute to the um, decomposition or the destruction of weed seeds. Um, of course, they're very important in nutrient cycling, breaking down that organic matter and um, uh, converting it from a type of um, nutrients that are bound up in organic matter, organic form to an inorganic form. That's called mineralization. That's a plant available form of nutrients, help plant grow. They contribute to your soil stability. And they also um, can, some of them produce uh, substances that can um, stimulate plant growth. And specific ones that contribute to plant nutrition and increase uh, plant health and also uh, tolerance or resistance to um, pests like uh, mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae are especially, I think, interesting. You know, mycorrhizae are those symbiotic fungi that grow in, into plant roots. Most species, except for um, plants in the buckwheat family and brassicas, and they form um, the symbiosis with plant roots and their hyphae grow out into soil and they really kind of knit your soil together in the rhizosphere. So they're really important for stabilizing soil um, and enhancing aggregate stability. They also produce a lot of polysaccharide. It's a, the, like a gluey material that they exude. In these pictures, it's been dyed so that you can see it. It's called glomalin. And it really, it's, it kind of glues soil together and it represents a, um, a lot of carbon in the soil. So mycorrhizae are really interesting. I'm sure you guys know a lot about mycorrhizae and um, their contribution to um, plant nutrition and that they can mine, especially phosphorus and extend that root biomass by acting like uh, roots as the hyphae grow out into the soil. Another kind of microorganism that's in the soil that we know less about, but is really interesting and we're learning more about it, is called the endophytic insect pathogenic fungi. So there are fungi in the soil that infect insects. And these are some pictures of some of the kind that are common in agricultural soils that we find. And um, about 10 years ago, it was um, discovered that some of these fungi, in addition to killing insects in the soil, can also grow into plant roots. And when they grow into plant roots, similar to mycorrhizae, they um, are, promote plant growth and they can also suppress um, insect feeding. And um, those effects are probably indirect. The, the, it's not the um, fungus itself that is suppressing the insects, it's their interaction with the plant. They turn on the plant's natural defensive system, the plant's immune system, and um, make the plant less attractive to uh, insect feeding and can suppress the growth of some insects that feed on those plants. Another really interesting thing that was um, has been discovered about these particular fungi in soil is that if you have an in, uh, insect that's been infected and killed by these uh, fungi, hyphae um, can grow out and grow into roots. And they actually, the plant can obtain nitrogen then from those insect cadavers that are infected with the fungus. And in exchange, the fungus gets carbon, similar to mycorrhizal fungi, which um, protect, you know, ha have benefits to the plant, but also get carbon from the plant in return. Okay, so how do these um, soil fungi affect um, insects? Well, um, so these insect pathogenic endophytes, those fungi that infect insects and can also grow in the plants, has been shown that they can um, reduce insect abundance, the reproductive rate of insects, larval survival, the weight of larvae, and when larvae are, um, are have don't have good weight, they don't make healthy adults, um, and they can decrease the amount of plant, plant eaten. And that's similar in mycorrhizae. Sometimes there's no net effect of uh, mycorrhizae on insects, but in general, they are beneficial um, in reducing insect uh, damage or increasing the tolerance of 
plants to insects. So we really want to um, uh, manage so that we can preserve these uh, microorganisms in soil. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, that next size class of organisms are the soil microfauna or the small animals. And these um, are important in soil to biological soil health because they can control the rate of decomposition and mineralization because they're feeding on those um, microbes that are the primary um, decomposers. And they also, when they're um, feeding in the soil, they're fragmenting organic matter and it makes it easier for my, the primary decomposers to decompose those smaller fragments of organic matter than the big chunks of organic matter. It's similar to us, we like to cut up our food before we eat it. Um, so these, um, these small animals are acting kind of like a knife and fork for the primary decomposers, which are um, bacteria and fungi. You know, as they're living and dying, they're eating and they're pooping and their um, waste products contribute to, the, uh, to soil fertility and also to aggregate stability in the soil. They themselves can be predators or um, pathogens of insects like this nematode is a beneficial nematode that infects insects that lives in the soil. They also um, provide food for the larger Organism. So it's all, they all interact in the soil food web. And they can also transport organisms through the soil. As you can see, this particular mite, with it has its own little smaller mites, but they can have um, microbes on their um, surface. Okay, and so the larger ones, the larger animals that we're all more familiar with because we can see them are called... Um, can be called ecosystem engineers because unlike these small organisms, these organisms are not big enough and strong enough to um, make um, soil structure. They can't make new pores and channels. They're sort of stuck in those pores and channels that are there. And so these ecosystem engineers, they are actually big enough and strong enough to make pores and channels in the soil and help build that soil structure. It's really important. You want your soil to be um, porous like um, a sponge, not like a brick. Okay, and so they're similar to those small animals. They're eating and they're um, creating waste products that add to the fertility of soil. They, a lot of them are predators, especially we have a lot of spiders um, in organic systems, ground beetles, tiger beetles, um, rove beetles that are all really important um, predators, earwigs can be important predators, especially of things like um, Western bean cutworm and fall armyworm. And they can transport organisms through the soil profile. We know that earthworms carry a lot of organisms through the soil. And they, again, are food for larger organisms that are beneficial in these systems. So sometimes I heard, I was just at a webinar the other day on soil health. <laughs> And they were talking about earthworms. And I really like this. They are ambassadors for soil health um, because they stimulate, if you have earthworms, it usually means there's a lot of other or beneficial organisms there too, because they stimulate the growth and activity of soil organisms because they tr um, allow transport of uh, organic matter and channels for air and water into the soil. And their channels are also enriched with um, nutrients. So earthworms, again, are, are good. Um, there are much smaller worms um, called potworms or enchytraids that do a similar thing. They're just not so visible and their pores are smaller. But, so if you don't have earthworms, you might have those other smaller ones that um, uh, behave similarly in the soil. So what are these, um, when we're managing for these beneficial soil organisms and for healthy soil to grow healthy crops, what do they need? Well, they need everything like we do. They need, um, most of all, they need space in the soil. So soil structure is really important. It's really important to uh, avoid compacting your soil um, because a lot of these organisms, they can't move. Like I said, they can't move soil. They're really restricted to those pores and channels that are there. Uh, and then they need water, air, and food. And the base of that soil food web is organic matter. And from there, the things that grow on organic matter, the other 
um, organisms are feeding on them. And so you do need organic matter as the base of that soil food web to keep your biological um, soil health going. And this is just my reminder again with this nematode that we need to avoid compaction to be able to have all these other things, um, resources available to soil organisms. And so there are principles that I didn't make up. The NRCS um, is promoting these four main principles of management um, for soil health, and they are good for soil biological health and for um, insect pest management. The first is to provide um, continuous living roots, and um, roots are really leaky. You know, plants are um, uh, convert, converting sunlight and water um, and uh, soil nutrients. They're producing a lot of uh, carbon uh, sugars, which um, are transferred to the roots, and the roots are super leaky. And so, um, by that leakiness, of these nutrients and carbon um, containing compounds that in the rhizosphere, that area around the root supports um, abundant biological life, especially microbial life. And um, plants, it turns out, can actually shape particular plants, species, shape their the community of microbes around them um, th so that there's a mutual benefit. And um, the interaction between these microbes and crops also changes the plant chemistry. And it can alter the plant chemistry and the volatile compounds, those um, sort of odors of plants that plants produce. And it can, that can change the attractiveness of plants to um, both pest organisms and to natural enemies. And this, Environment, a uh, high nutrient, high carbon environment also um, supports um, organisms like mycorrhizal fungi and encourages um, that association. And so um, those organisms in the rhizosphere can uh, turn on the uh, plant's immune system. For example, there are certain kinds of bacteria called plant growth promoting rhizobacteria or PGPR. And uh, um, these endophytic fungi, the fungi that can grow into plant uh, roots and also um, fungi and other organisms that grow on the outside of um, plant roots in the rhizosphere. And sometimes even root feeding, <laughs> your wireworms that you talked about, a little bit of root feeding they stimulate the plant's immune system and um, cause a phenomenon um, of induced resistance. And so if a, if a microorganism causes this induced resistance, it's called systemic acquired resistance. If an insect or um, other small animal, if their feeding causes that, it's called induced systemic resistance. But what happens is that association in the roots turns on the plant immune system and it turns on the plant immune system in the whole plant. And that's why it's called um, systemic. And this is demonstrated to really, um, at least for some insects, make these plants less attractive to um, and more tolerant to feeding uh, than plants where this immune system has not been turned on. Okay, so that's um, why it's important. One of, some of the reasons why it's important to always have living roots in the soil. So for example, having cover crops in your rotation or some um, uh, perennial phases in your rotation. Uh, another principle is to minimize disturbance. And in ag systems, our main uh, causes of disturbance are physical through tillage and cultivation um, and chemical. And, and in, this is, you know, we have a lot of, um, potentially have a lot of beneficial organisms in organic systems because in field cropping systems, at least we don't use, if any, uh, pesticides, even, you know, allowable pesticides, um, because it's really not economical. Um, and then fertilizers um, are another cause of chemical disturbance in conventional systems. And so where we reduce tillage, we expect to see um, an increase in predators, 
predatory insects and invertebrates, an increase in those decomposers that help nutrient cycling, and sort of um, not a huge effect on pests. Some pests are worse in um, reduced tillage systems. Some are, um, there are fewer in reduced systems, but by far there are definitely more natural enemies and earthworms where we can reduce tillage either through rotation or practicing some other you know, reduced tillage um, practice, <laughs> um, like rolling cover crops and no-till planting into rolled cover crops. And in conventional tillage, where we have a, a really clean till system, we expect a reduction in the number of predators on the soil, <clears throat> a decrease in the number of decomposers that are involved in nutrient cycling. And again, some pests are adapted to these systems. Um, and some pests aren't. So the pest community tends to be a little bit different in those two extremes of that system. So um, pests that are more or less common with tillage or, um, are things like black cutworm, armyworm, and slugs because you're, um, these things like to feed like black cutworm and armyworm and some of the other um, noctuid worms, they like to feed at night um, and they, go, um, they're in the soil during the day. And so when we till, we're disrupting those stages that are usually in the soil during the day. More common with tillage, seed corn maggot, the flies are attracted to that decomposing organic matter when you turn in uh, cover crops or other residue, corn leaf aphid tends to be more common with um, tillage if that's a problem that you have. Um, there's a lot of insects though that aren't affected by tillage really at all. Corn rootworms, European corn borer, fall armyworm, corn earworm, western bean cutworm. So it's not going to matter if you till or not for some of these pests. Again, there are lots of natural enemies, um, both above ground and associated with the soil. The soil is a tremendous reservoir of uh, predatory uh, insects and also insect pathogens like nematodes and fungi. And we know that as you increase the number of disturbances, you decrease the number of soil associated predators. We have done experiments with um, it rolling cover crops and no-till planting into those rolled mat, and then comparing that with um, tilled systems. And we see that the more um, disturbance you have, the fewer uh, predators you have in field crops and probably other crops too. And we know that that's important because um, the, this, these graphs show that the more predators that you have in these systems, we measure how much insect prey they eat. The more predators you have, the more insect prey they're eating. And this is probably why in our system for so many years, we didn't really have a lot of um, pest problems because we had these tremendous numbers of um, predatory insects. They're really voracious. When we put out sentinel eggs, it's like in a matter of days, you put out these egg masses and in a couple of days, they're just totally gone um, in these systems where you have a lot of um, predation. Okay, so oh, I already I'm talked- sorry. There's a yeah. question in the chat and maybe you'll get to this later. But it's a question I always get too, as well as Kyle apparently, um, that some farmers um, make the comment that certain soil pH, plant sugar levels, and other soil um, characteristics like calcium can increase plant defenses and limit the impact of harmful insects. That a specific soil pH is an example has been shown to reduce harmful insects. What are your thoughts on our knowledge and research? What, what data is can um, has about those sorts of? Um, yeah, feedback. I'm going to get to that actually. Oh, awesome. I have okay. Slides on that. Okay, wonderful. Right. Okay, <laughs> if you can wait just a second. <laughs> so these insect um, parasitic I mean insect parasitic fungi again, as I mentioned, they're really common in soil and they parasitize insects. So. Um, those insects are always there. The insect pests are always there. And you have these natural enemies keeping them to sort of non-nuisance levels a lot of time. If, the, if your soil health is 
um, really um, working. And the infectious, unlike mycorrhizae, which grow through the soil as that thread-like hyphae, a lot of these fungi, they exist in the soil as spores. Here you can see this is a, a insect, this big white ball here is a type of fungus called Bovaria. There's an infected insect in there and these are the, um, it's growing those thread-like hyphae that are growing out of that dead insect and making spores. And some have even grown out into the soil and are making spores in the soil. So when these um, insect, <clears throat> parasitic fungi infect insects, what you end up with is like where the insect used to be, now there's a big clump of spores. So it's very much just a clump, right? It's not spread throughout. So for organisms like that, that can't spread themselves through soil by like growing extensively through the soil like hyphae, a little bit of disturbance actually spreads them around a little bit and you find it's it's more likely that they'll come into contact with either plant roots that they can grow into or um, with insects that may be moving, larger insects that may be moving through the soil. So um, a little bit of soil disturbance isn't bad for some of these organisms. It is detrimental for mycorrhizae if you do a lot of extensive tillage. But for these organisms that are in their beneficial bacteria, fungi that exist in the soil as spores or individual cells, a little bit of uh, disturbance can uh, mix them up in the soil and distribute them from their like clumped distribution after they've infected an insect. Okay, the other type of Disturbance, of course, in organic systems, this is much less of a problem than um, in conventional systems it are synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. And we know even in organic systems, when you have excessive nitrogen, when you have excessive nutrients in your soil, excessive fertility, that actually is not good for um, plants. It, in high plant tissue, um, nitrogen really decreases plant uh, resistance in that natural immune system that plants have, and it increases their susceptibility to insect plants and plant disease. So you can have too much of a good thing, and um, you uh, do not want to uh, have excessive nitrogen levels, and it's bad for the environment. So there was a recent study <clears throat> that was reported last year, and this was in Europe, it wasn't in the United States, but I kind of suspect that it would be similar here. Uh, they screened 100 fields, 40 of those were um, organic and 60 were conventional, and they screened them for 46 pesticides or pesticide breakdown products. And they found uh, pesticides or those breakdown products in all the fields, including the organic fields, although the number of uh, residues and the concentration was much higher in the conventional systems than in the organic systems. But unfortunately, even in fields that had been in organic for a long period of time, in some cases 20 years, they still found um, residues from these insecticides. Um, although the number and the kind of um, pesticides decreased with time in organic. Um, <clears throat> they found that where soil pHs were higher, um, the biodegradation of those pesticide residues was decreased. Um, and it also decreased the mobility of those pesticide residues so that uh, if they were water soluble, I guess they um, did not solubilize as quickly where the soil pH was higher, and I don't know if that was microbial or just a chem, you know, function of the chemistry. Um, and that mycorrhizal biomass and abundance of mycorrhizae were negatively linked to the number of pesticide residues in soil. And um, they concluded that pesticides in soil were likely a key driver of mycorrhizal abundance, and mycorrhizae, of course, are important um, in soil health and in plant health which affects their susceptibility and attractiveness to insect pests. And so this is just, these are the residuals, but it shows the general pattern with number of pesticide residues at a site 
in the conventionally tilled conventional systems, the no-till conventional systems in the organic. You can see the organic has higher um, numbers of mycorrhizal roots and microbial biomass than these conventional systems. Um, but again, um, they were still negatively affected by uh, pesticide residues. And here's the pH. What they found was most important for microbial, they measured a lot of different factors in the soil. And they found that microbial biomass and the amount of roots that were colonized by mycorrhizae, the most important factors, positive factor, was pH, having a, a balanced pH um, was really important. And the red bars, negative effect, the number of pesticides was the driver, the most important driver for microbial pest, uh, biomass, carbon or microbial biomass in mycorrhizal. So, um, you know, if you're just recently transitioning, one would hope that those pesticide residues from the past would um, gradually decrease. And so your soil health should increase with that. Um, but the removal of pesticides from those systems should, um, help you build um, soil health. However, um, I don't know, you might have some vegetable growers here that um, I know in field crops, we don't use a lot of even allowable pesticides, um, but of course there are allowable pesticides in organic systems. And just because they're allowable and they're from a natural source does not necessarily mean they're harmless. And we know, for example, that most nitrogen fixing bacteria like rhizobium, um, most copper-based fungicides are deleterious to those. For mycorrhizae um, is compatible with some of these um, allowed materials like spinosids, pyrethrums, and um, the plant oils, but neem is very um, inhibitory to mycorrhizae and can cause um, significant shifts in the populations of those mycorrhizal communities. And the fungus, one of the fungi, um, that insect pathogen, and the it can be endophytic that um, I work with, metarhizium, compatible with spinosad, but all of those um, mycoparasite project products that are usually sold as uh, plant growth enhancers or um, to protect from uh, plant disease, um, they are um, detrimental to metarhizium, and I would assume probably some other fungi too, because these things are parasites of fungi. And so they would attack probably not just plant pathogenic fungi, but other kinds of fungi in the soil. And neem is um, toxic to these fungi too. So um, even in systems where you use these allowable materials, I think we need to be careful about um, how we use them judiciously because they can have negative impacts on uh, soil health. Manure, we, 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 um, someone brought up manure in general. Overall, the broad pattern is, is that manure is actually beneficial uh, for soil health and plant health and um, for um, pest management um, where we use manure um, for fertility. Uh, plants have higher um, levels of those chemical defense um, compounds and um, there tend to be uh, greater numbers of insect predators. Um, there are more alternate preys that they can um, survive on. There's usually greater microbial activity in soil and, and the, your organic matter is higher, which also contributes to your soil biological health, as opposed to where you're using inorganic um, fertility, <clears throat> where um, you tend to have more plant feeding insects, less and lower uh, chemical defenses in those plants, uh, lower organic matter, and lower microbial activity. Okay, am I running out of time? All right. Um, and so that the third uh, principle is to have a surface residue. And this is sort of a double-edged sword. It probably you need to know your system and what you have in the environment because it can provide a tremendous um, habitat for especially spiders and ground beetles. Um, on the other side, if you have like a lot of slug problems with slugs or uh, insects, if you have can, a lot of you know annually problems with uh, the worms like um, black cutworm, um, you might 
want to <clears throat> not have a really heavy uh, surface residue. You know, we have other benefits from surface residues, though. They can really um, control the fluctuation of soil moisture and uh, temperature, which is actually good for soil health and for these predatory insects, can suppress weed growth. Um, and it can provide, you know, it eventually becomes organic matter as it's decomposed in your soil. On the other hand, you know, you need, if you're going to use it for weed control, you need a lot of biomass. This is three tons per acre, but we find it's more like six or eight, depends on your weed pressure, not effective for suppressing perennial weeds. If you have a really recalcitrant, um, high fiber residue, it can tie up nitrogen. As the microbes in the soil compete for that nitrogen with your crop. Uh, and probably more of a concern, like in our area and your areas, it can really delay soil warm up in the spring. You probably need to use some um, row openers or row cleaners um, to allow soil to warm up um, so that you can get that seed to germinate and grow as quickly as possible. And if you have a really heavy, we found if you have a really heavy residue, it can be really challenging without really good equipment to, um, to get the planter to, to um, function properly in planting. This is just an example from a, um, this is potatoes, but it, it shows where um, surface mulch was applied and then they looked at the, um, the number of predatory insects, in this case, ground beetles that they had. And what they found is where they applied straw mulch early, that's where this green line is in two years. They had much higher numbers of uh, beneficial predatory ground beetles in those systems than where they had applied it later or not at all. They did um, reduce the abundance of um, potato leaf hopper and the plant damage from potato leaf hopper where they had high residue amount or mulch. Um, they did increase the abundance of Colorado potato beetle, but it reduced the amount of egg masses and larvae they had, and it's probably due to predation because they had increased predator abundance. And in, um, but they're, even though they had those um, higher predator numbers, um, the potato yields were similar in mulched and um, unmulched plots. So even though they had a little bit higher pest pressure, it didn't result in greater damage. Okay, and this is from an apple orchard um, where they looked at microbial functional diversity. That, that's kind of the jobs that different um, organisms in the soil are doing. And what they found is where they had an organic um, surface residue they had um, cornstalk mulch or ryegrass mulch. The microbial diversity was much greater than where they had no surface residue in a conventional tillage system or where they had used a black um, ground fabric for mulch. So um, that organic mulching um, really increased their um, functional diversity, um, which is what you want. You want a lot of diversity of these microbes in the soil to contribute to soil health. Okay, and um, of course, a lot of surface residue, if you can manage this system, can um, be very weed um, suppressive. We also find that these beneficial fungi, in this case, the one I'm working with, this um, metarhizium, which is that insect pathogenic endophytic fungus, needs some soil moisture and where we have good soil moisture and characteristics that are related to soil moisture, we have a uh, higher abundance or higher prevalence of that organism. There's a negative relationship with sand. Okay, and the final um, principle is to maximize biodiversity. And I think that's a message that everybody commonly gets because biodiversity supports pest regulation through um, promotion of those predatory and um, insect pathogenic organisms. And it does a lot of other things too. It increases pollination, nutrient cycling, carbon um, sequestration, and it increases the likelihood when you have high diversity, it increases the likelihood that something you want to be there will be there. And so the way we can manage um, for that biodiversity um, we know that continuous monocultures 
are um, susceptible to pests and damage, and that um, diversifying crop rotations can break up pest cycles and provide more resources for natural enemies and beneficial organisms. Um, we can have diversity in space, which are, are things like, you know, under seeding and insectary strips or intercropping, um, planting diverse crop um, species and varieties. And of, of course we can have diversity in time, which is required in organic systems. We need to have a good crop rotation um, as opposed to continuous cropping of one type can have um, incor incorporate cover crops and um, double cropping. And so really for pest management, we wanna um, focus on building soil health um, to enhance the soil function, which includes pest suppression. And so we to promote natural pest control and to also support um, those natural plant defense mechanisms by um, supporting beneficial microbes that can help turn on or prime those defense systems um, and deter pests. And then we want to um, really, if we're in systems where you have materials that are economical to use, we wanna use those only if our um, uh, yield goals are not, or quality goals are not being met. And so this is where I started. Um, so that is what I have prepared. I know we had a little bit of discussion on fall armyworm at the beginning. So did someone mention seed corn maggot earlier? I mentioned seed corn maggot. Yeah, for sure. yeah. so yeah, well, you know, we got hit by Western. We used to have a monitoring program for Western bean cutworm because you know, in about 2000, it started moving from the Great Plains. It started moving um, uh, eastward. And so we started a monitoring program and we never had a problem with it until this year. Um, and we had ceased that monitoring program. But what's really bad about Western bean cutworm is that it's not cannibalistic. So you can have several uh, insects per ear. It likes to bore into the ear and it really, um, it really increases the susceptibility to these molds and mycotoxins. So this is a pest that's very worrisome. And um, that's another one you can monitor for and you can um, go to those websites and monitor for. It's really hard to catch when they're early. It's easier to know when the adults are um, flying um, because otherwise you need to monitor for the egg masses. Um, and there's really not a lot you can do except in a high value crop. I mean, in a field crop, there probably isn't a lot you can do. Um, there's strong flyers. Um, there are materials registered for them for in higher value use in higher value crops, like, um, but uh, mostly it's, you would, um, if you needed to monitor for this pest, it would be um, through those um, insect monitoring sites. Yeah, the um, seed corn maggot, we have gotten, had some of the problems with that. Again, that's sort of the, the uh, flies are, the first generation flies emerge um, in, at, in your field or near your fields and um, they're looking for nice decomposing or places with nice decomposing organic matter to lay their eggs in the soil. And so when you plant your seed into that, when it germinates, that's very attractive and good resource for the larvae that um, like to feed on those germinating seeds. And it's really a problem in cool, wet springs where you have heavy textured or wet soils, high organic matter uh, levels, and where you've tilled either manure or green manures into the soil so that it's decomposing. So yeah, your recommendation of waiting is good. Um, this is just the life cycle. We all know, you know, the flies lay eggs, the eggs hatch into larvae that attack those um, germinating seeds, and then they eventually pupate. But that's all been modeled, so we know how many growing degree days on average that takes. Um, there is no rescue treatment, but they do have a lot of natural enemies. And again, avoiding planting into wet soil. Um, Reduced tillage, when we um, 
trap for these flies emerging in our tilled and our reduced tillage systems, organic systems, we hardly have any of these flies emerging out of the no-till or the reduced tillage systems, but we have a, a we can trap flies coming emerging out of the tilled soil. Michael so O'Donnell had a question about stink bugs in soybeans. Oh. We talked about that before. And it's, I don't know if we saw that in Wisconsin, but he said that that was um, pretty prevalent in Indiana this year. Yeah, I don't, we have not had really that big of a problem with stink bug. I know brown marmorated stink bug has been an invasive pest, has some natural enemies, but in terms of, yeah. I can, I can speak up to our Those, experience. Good, good. Speak from experience, please. <clears throat> okay. So I work with an operation in Northwest Indiana, about halfway between Indianapolis and Chicago. Um, all acres are organic or transition. And uh, we had, um, it was more the, the stink bugs resulted in um, sort of secondary mm. pathogen issues. So I did speak with Christian Krupke at Purdue okay. about what we experienced. And I think that's kind of what cued us in on the stink bug issue and that there was, there were problems more widely in that part of the, at least in that, in that region. But, uh, we had, a, um, a number of fields that resulted in, uh, varying amounts of, Kind of shriveled, yeah, colored, and rotten soybeans. Mm -hmm. And Christian basically explained that because we had submitted samples to the lab, and at first the field crop pathologist looked at it and she passed it off. And so I spoke with Christian. He said, "Yes, <clears throat> stink bugs. You know, with their piercing, mm -hmm. um, piercing sucking, whatever, yeah, yeah, introducing yeasts and molds and and things that." could persist and cause problems. And his explanation was that, you know, they're, they're just generally in the population and it's not, not necessarily the, the brown marmorated, but probably just oh, the regular. Yeah. There's green a green, bugs. green stink bug. Yeah. And that they're attracted to anything that's essentially senescent, senescing and ripening. <clears throat> and so if we have like a, a, a soybean field, that's like starting that process early or late relative to other soybeans in the area or something that can attract a larger okay. population result in potential damage relative to fields where they may have been ripening or senescing at the same time more broadly with soybean production in the area. And that might explain why we had some fields that were that had quite a bit of damage and then others that had zero damage. And then yeah. he, he encouraged us to kind of relook at planting dates and harvest dates and maturity and things like that to think about sort of this, this ripening or senescing sequencing relative to um, everybody else in the neighborhood. Yeah, that's a great point. And, um, and he is a great source of information, Christian Krupke. I, uh, I, you know, a lot of the stuff that I um, report, I get from his um, materials, which brings up another point, you know, your extension, even though if, even if it's not specifically aimed at organic growers, there's a lot of the basic in those extension um, publications, which are often free to download um, from extension websites at universities um, like Purdue or Wisconsin or Minnesota. Um, those are free to download and they have a lot of information about the biology of these pests and you bring up planting date and um, sort of relay movement of pests between um, different uh, maturity groups and planting. I think that's really important because there are some pests and depending on what you have in your environment, um, and some pests benefit from like early planting. Some, the, the pressure might be worse if you had planted early and some are worse if you had planted late and, um, and so it's kind of good. I mean, it is good if you um, have had issues with particular pests to either talk to your extension educator um, like Christian or um, to look at some of this um, published 
these publications, these extension publications or watch for the bulletins, even though they're not targeted at organic growers. I mean, there's very little out there. You're lucky to have Aaron um, that really focus on organic growers. And of course that's a, a wonderful resource, but there's still um, information to be gleaned from that information um, produced for conventional growers, especially around planting date and when pest pressures, like this whole modeling of seed corn maggot. I mean, that's all developed for uh, conventional systems, but we can still take advantage of those monitoring sites and pest um, reports and surveys um, and, um, and, you know, these growing degree day models that kind of here last year, um, this was for Pennsylvania where we were, you know, if the flies were emerging in um, April because they had amassed enough growing degree days and it wasn't in the fly free period wasn't until the end of May. And so if, if you had planted any time between those um, times, uh, it would be, and you had a population of seed corn maggot, it, it would be likely that you would suffer damage if you had the conditions of, you know, cool, wet spring and um, uh, tilled organic matter, and then you planted into that, um, there's a probability that you're, um, that you would have pressure from seed corn maggot, especially if you monitored them with either yellow sticky cards or a yellow bowl trap like that and saw that you had flies. There's another question in the chat um, specifically about applying sugar or molasses to increase plant bricks to make the plants less effective to attractive insect invasions. There was a conventional co-op using molasses to treat alfalfa weevil this spring saying that the insects engorge themselves on the sugars and die. Is that more related to the molasses or bricks or neither <laughs> it's just I know you know I know nothing about molasses do using that I there are baits there are baits that incorporate um molasses in conventional system you know they have baits that have insecticides plus those things and um in grits and some kind of carrier to um attract the pest to eat the in, uh, insecticide but um and that there are also baits like that to attract beneficial organisms because a lot of these like parasitoids um, and some predatory insects, they also need sugars to survive. They, they, they want other things in their diet besides other insects or insect food, you know. But in terms of the bricks issue, that one, I know there's a lot of talk about having high bricks and um, but I really, I have not read anything in the scientific literature about that. Not that, that there isn't anything valid by people's observations or experience. And if someone has experience with that and has um, realized a benefit, please speak up and tell us what, you know, what you know, because I'd be interested in hearing that too. Has anybody used that? I know in some compost teas, you know, you have a carbon source like that too. It's a little scary to me, actually. <laughs> but um, definitely one of the many areas that we need more. I know, I know. <laughs> we definitely need, well, and we need funding too. Yeah. Oh, well, you can't retire yet, Mary. There's way no, too it, you need open a, it, so, you know, some, <laughs> a lot of these things, you know. Even if you proposed to do the research on them, a lot of them are just so unknown. And so, you know, in science, we like to control all the variables, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, because we like it to be reproducible, what we find. But some of these practices um, are just so variable. Um, like, and so, Scientists don't like to, when they review your proposals, they don't like to fund them because they think, how are you going to control the variability of, you know, this formulation or that formulation? It's going to be different every time you, you know, use it um, or test it. So, yeah, that's an interesting area. Um, I have just conversationally heard a lot of Rick's talk, but um, I know nothing about that. 
Erin, do you know anything about that? I don't. I, you know, I get it's, I think these ecological systems where it's, it's just hard to control and, and if just like, just because we don't have the data obviously doesn't mean that there's not something out there. Right. But no, get, absolutely. <laughs> I also get cautious when there's sometimes overstatements of products because there isn't the data necessarily it's to um, confirm that it works. So it's, but it's a tough situation for farmers to be in because there isn't necessarily a lot of, of guidance. So I, no. I see kind of both sides of the coin that right. definitely a little bit of a buyer beware when trying some of these products that yeah. don't have data but again just because there's not data it doesn't mean that there isn't something to it so i always advise people to start small and be exactly. observant and have control plots so that you can see how it works on your farm no that's exactly what i recommend too is like yeah don't buy it for the whole farm <laughs> just like give it a test and then you know there's can also be variability between years because biological systems are so affected by things like weather and when the moisture comes, how much moisture, how much, how warm. So it's really challenging. So I admire farmers who can deal with all that variability. It's kind of amazing that we can grow the crops we do sometimes, I feel like, with all the unpre unpredictability in some of these um, systems. We are just about at time. Thank you so much, Mary, for mm -hmm. joining us and um, presenting a whole wealth of information on a variety of topics, including more detailed insect management and, and the bigger picture of how the soil, which is such a foundation of organic, impacts our ability to um, manage insects and those dynamics. So I will post the recording on the, the website. If there's any follow-up that anyone needs, don't hesitate to, to email me and we'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. So thank you again, Mary. Okay, thank you. Bye.